warm welcome to Rick, please. Quickly. Um, basically, three years ago in Fukushima, they had three meltdowns in two days. This is a shot of reactor number three exploding. There's a close-up. The blast went basically about five times as high as the building, and you can see huge chunks of the roof were blown up there. That's in reactor three. I'll come back to it in a, in a second, because there's a difference between the way the three reactors blew up. This next slide uh, doesn't show up very well. Okay, on the left here, you can see that was reactor one blowing up. Basically, the blast went sideways. From reactor th three, the blast basically went vertically. And most scientists whose opinions I read say there was probably a conflagration in reactor one, which is hydrogen exploding. Think of woof sound. And this is probably um, a quick spontaneous nuclear fission. Basically, basically, there's probably been a small nuclear reaction inside reactor three. I'll push on fairly quickly. There, there is a, um, when Fukushima popped off, the wind would blew most of the poison out into the Pacific. The wind came from the northwest for a little while on day two when reactor three was leaking season all over the place. That's why you have the pink shape. And as you can see, it comes down to very close to Tokyo. Basically, all of that red area should be uninhabitable for humans. Humans shouldn't live there. The same, that is the same degree of contamination that you find in Chernobyl and where people are not allowed to live, you know, where, where it is that contaminated. That is basically what is left from reactor three when it blew up. There is a, um, from on top of the uh, site, you can see what's going on there. Basically, uh, I haven't got my little pointer thing, doesn't matter. Sorry, basically you can see at the top right hand corner, uh, reactor four, then number three, complete smoking ruin, which was smoking. This is about two days after the accident. The one on the top right hand corner is reactor four, which hadn't blown up yet. What I want you to notice on this photo is the steam coming out of the reactor. I want, to put, I want to remind you, TEPCO for the first three months said the reactors are all in cold shutdown, we have not had a meltdown. And while they're saying it's in cold shutdown, it has obviously melted, had a meltdown, it's obviously broken its containment, broken out of its containment. That steam coming out is containing cesium, strontium, plutonium, all the rest of it, the whole 10 yards. They lied for three months saying that it was in cold shutdown when it wasn't. The other point I want to make is that they detected xenon-91 and other radioactive gases at the perimeter of the plant two hours before the tsunami struck. In other words, they had already started to have a meltdown from the earthquake because the cooling pipes running into the building were fractured when the whole building is shaken around. That's a really important point to remember. It's not the tsunami that did this, it's an earthquake that did this. And they have 50, the Japanese have 50 nuclear reactors in their, in, in their earthquake zones. Um, three minutes gone already. This is reactor four, as you can see. It's had a, and it, it, had, <coughs> it did not have fuel in its reactor at the time. It only had fuel in the spent fuel pool. Reactor three next to it did have fuel, had a meltdown. The meltdown produces hydrogen. The hydrogen is produced when the fuel rods are in, um, uh, the fuel is in fuel rods made of zirconium. If the zirconium is exposed to steam at about 600 degrees centigrade, the zirconium strips strips the oxygen out of the water, forms zirconium oxide, releases hydrogen. In other words, when we had two hydrogen explosions in reactor one and reactor three on the second day, it was then completely obvious to me, and I'm not a trained scientist, to anyone else who bothers to pay attention, completely obvious on the second day that they had a full meltdown, yet for three months, TEPCO officials were continuing to say, oh no, it is in cold shutdown. This is outrageous. Okay, pushing quickly along. Here's an example of the condition of the, of the plant. There's 100, 250 foot high exhaust stacks, and this is a close up of one of the supports, um, the sort of framework around the outside of the exhaust stack. As you can see, it's been wiggled by the earthquake and has rusted through. The, plant, the whole plant is in this sort of condition, ripped, rusting, torn. Here is a picture of how it should look. As you can see, it's sort of an inverted light bulb with a donut around the bottom. 
Um, here is another one. I'm just showing these quickly to give you an idea of how, the, how it should be. Basically, the little red sort of pill in the middle is the, actual, is the RPV, reactor pressure vessel. The yellow of the, around the outside, the light bulb, and the blue around the bottom is the PCV, pressure containment vessel, which is meant to, if anything goes wrong in the red pill bit in the middle, the outside, the light bulb, is meant to be a containment and stop any radioisotopes, get, radioisotopes getting out into the environment. What has happened is reactors one, two, and three, they've had a meltdown. The RPV, reactor pressure vessel, the red pill in the middle, break, has broken within six to eight hours in each case. The pressure containment vessel has broken in all three cases. Another one, this is how it should look when it's running well. You can see the reactor is the sort of red cube in the middle. And I've shown you this to show how dangerous it is. They bubble the water in from the bottom. It gets heated up to red hot by the little red cube. Then they have, then it turns to steam. They take the steam out the top, run it into the steam generators. They have about four feet of water over the top of the rods. If something goes wrong, such as, for example, an earthquake, if you're in an earthquake zone or a tsunami, you lose that four feet of water over the rods. As soon as the top of the rods is exposed, the zirconium in them starts to melt down and catches fire. Now, what's happened in Fukushima? Here is one of the best guesses that I've come across. It's melted to the bottom of, that's the red pill in the, other, in the other structure, it's melted to the bottom of that. The thing about these designs, you get the reactor in the middle of kind of this red pill, the control rods all come in from the bottom, which means when this the reactor, the red cube part, starts to melt down, it goes down to the bottom and then immediately burns through. Where the control rods come through, they have kind of, they have not very strong gaskets around each control rod. General Electric built it this way because it's cheaper and easier than having the control rods coming in from the top because they want to load the fuel in and out from the top. So they build a really strong metal container and then they drill holes in it so they can put the control rods in through the bottom. As soon as they have a problem, whatever melts down goes straight out for the holes with, around where the control rods come in, then melts down to the bottom of the PCV, pressure, pressure containment vessel, or the light bulb here. As you can see, slumps to the floor. Now there's a lot of debate about whether it has slumped to the floor there and then burned through the last three feet of concrete and then the six inches or so, eight inches, I think, of steel around the bottom, or whether it's only burned halfway through that. Personally, I think it hasn't burned through the bottom of the pressure containment vessel or we would be seeing far more poisonous water than the very deadly water we're seeing now. It's probably gone off to the side here and is lying around in the, that's the donut sliced through, lying around in the, um, it's called the suppression chamber. So. <clears throat> Ooh, I've only got three minutes, I must hurry up. Um, here's another close-up I showed you. I want, okay, I'm going to jump on head a bit. Here, <coughs> here you can see where the fuel has come down onto the concrete floor, and then where the tubes go down into the donut bit, there's actually metal exposed there. There's no concrete. It's almost certainly burned through the metal there. It gets into the little bit under there, which is a drain for condensation, and then that drains out to the bottom. So this water around the bottom here basically has the nuclear fuel, water running over the nuclear fuel, coming out there and then filling the basement of the building there. I did a few close-ups here which I haven't got time to go into very much. Um, this I'm showing you to show, they, they set in a probe down the side here and they managed to measure the, the radiation about once every foot or so. And as you can see, round about the level of the top of the water there, they're getting radiation of eight sieverts an hour. Now, four sieverts are now, four sieverts will kill you. If you get four sieverts of radiation, you'd be in hospital for two or three weeks, all your hair would fall out, your digestion doesn't work anymore, two thirds of you would die, strong ones would survive. Six sieverts would kill anyone, for sure. The radiation around here is eight sieverts in an hour. If someone's in there working for three quarters of an hour, they're gonna get six sieverts and they're dead for sure. Not maybe. Now, here's a more horrifying one. This is from reactor one. If you look at the numbers there, um, they, they put in a probe, you can't quite see it, they put in a probe on this side and they lowered it down, it's the four green dots, the uh, four green squares there, and they took measurements in each, in each of those places, and they get 39 sieverts, 54 sieverts, 57 sieverts, 72 sieverts. 72 sieverts, that is more than a sievert a minute. If you're there for five minutes, you're going to get six sieverts, you're going to be dead. Now that shows why these buildings are impossible to enter and clean up. And the Japanese said, as soon as it happened, oh, we'll clean it up in 40 years' time. Within 40 years, here's our plan, it'll be cleaned in 40 years. To do that, they had to develop robots which can go in there and work in this radiation. All the electronics we have at the moment, when it goes into a, this radiated an environment, ceases to work within 
10, 15 minutes. So they have to develop a new series of robots with hardened electronics which can stand up to this radiation. And they say, oh, no worries, we'll have that worked out in 15 or 20 years. Right? In my opinion, no way. No way. When I saw Fukushima pop off on TV, I thought, wow, learn this word. We're going to be talking minute, about this okay. word for hundreds of I'm years. I saw the lights off. Okay, it's thank you. Minute. I'll be real quick. Now, just talking about the groundwater, the blue line there is roughly the level of the groundwater, and that's the plant. So what they were doing for a long time is try and pump the water out of the plant so it comes in from the groundwater and, doesn't, and then doesn't go back out into the groundwater. They've run out of storage capacity to do that. That's why they were pumping out four or 500 tonnes a day. This shows what their problem is. The water, 1,000 tonnes a day, passes through the site. Some of it goes into the building, mixes with fuel, comes back out in, into the groundwater, and then goes into the Pacific Ocean, which is, you know, 150 metres away. This is the, the, the geology of the area. <coughs> Basically, as you can see, there's per several permeable layers there in which they have already detected radiation. Actually, this picture goes down to 50, uh, 50 metres. I was reading the other day that a sample they did from 80 metres already contains strontium. So it's already down below the level of the sea in all the groundwater under the plant. This is spent fuel pool number four. Okay, I'll just finish this point. Spent fuel pool number four, as you can see, a lot of concrete has been blown into these basically metal boxes. The, any concrete going down the side of the metal boxes between the box and its container could quite easily jam as they're trying to draw the, the uh, spent fuel rods out, and it is quite likely one of them will snap or break. When these things snap or break, it is time to evacuate the plant, they will then lose control over the plant because they won't be there to adjust all the pipes and everything else and keep the water running. Therefore, you would probably get a fuel pool fire and you would have to evacuate a third of your country and, ab and abandon Tokyo. Thank I'd love to talk much. another 10 minutes, but that'll do me now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, you were talking about nuclear fuel rods before. I just want to talk a little bit about the design of the plants in Fukushima. They are boiling water reactors. It's a design from General Electric in the 1950s, who won World War II, so they said to, to Japan, here, build these, do what you're told, basically, in my opinion. Um, it's an old design the General that was for a nuclear submarine, therefore it's very compact, therefore they stored the fuel, when they refueled it, they stored, had to store the fuel near to the reactor. General Electric took this design, made it three times bigger, gave it to the Japanese and said, build this. I didn't understand this until Fukushima popped off and I started looking into it. The, the, fuel, it's the spent fuel is lifted out the top of the reactor and then stored in a pool up on the fourth story of the reactors. Now these are concrete buildings in a, I think we will all admit we know already, an earthquake zone concrete buildings with an earthquake zone with a swimming pool on the fourth floor full of totally lethal stuff which, if it is not kept underwater for the first five years, immediately starts to burn and poisons everything within, within a thousand kilometres. Japan has about 30 of these. The United States has about 30 or 40 of the same design. They're now 40 years old. Plants that are 40 years old. That is why the Americans are not talking about what is going wrong at Fukushima. The, the Japanese are not admitting how bad Fukushima is. I think it would probably cost around half a trillion, $500 billion to clean up properly, even though it's impossible to clean up, but even to do as well as you could, it would cost that amount of money. The Japanese don't want to admit that Fukushima is a big, expensive, horrible mess, because then they would not be able to restart the other 48 nuclear reactors that they've got, and the United States would not be able to keep running the 104 nuclear reactors of very similar design that they've got. Right? And then, to finish up, if I may, one story which came... Um, on the internet today. It's from the Australian, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, who have spoken to someone from TEPCO, a TEPCO insider, who's speaking anonymous, anonymously. He'll lose his job if, he, if they find out who he is. A nuclear industry insider has told the ABC that the situation at the stricken Fukushima reactor is still not under control. At the risk of losing his job if his identity is revealed, a senior TEPCO staffer who has worked at the Fukushima plant for more than 20 years says the situation at the reactor is not under control and no one knows how to fix the problem. The whistleblower says mistakes are made weekly, contaminated water leaks into the Pacific Ocean every day. That's about 400 tonnes a day straight into the Pacific. The insider says the damaged reactors can never be decontaminated and that people should not be moved back into the no-go zone, the 20 kilometre exclusion area around Fukushima. Thank you. That's a TEPCO insider saying that. I mean, say no more, eh? And then finally, Paul.